Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about the harsh realities of vlogging in Japan. Coming up. Alright, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japan. Today's episode, guys, I'm going to be doing a video response to the Red Value. So for me, I've been following the J-Vlogging community, Japan Vlogging community, pretty much since its inception back in the mid-2000s with the advent of YouTube. And so I would follow guys like Tokyo Kuni, the late great Roger Swan, Jason from the My Argonauts channel, Hiko Simon, Busan Kevin, and just a whole slew of others out there. And a lot of them who have sadly come and gone from the YouTube platform over the years. And so back in the day, it was actually pretty easy to get an audience because there wasn't a whole lot of people on YouTube making content and certainly not a whole lot of them making that quality Japan content as we come to know and love. So like I said, pretty easy for a lot of new expats and even some older experienced expats to get an audience just sharing their stories on camera, whether it's in the rooms like I'm doing now, taking it back old school or going out and about and showing you the sights of Tokyo, Osaka, and elsewhere in Japan. And back in the day, I actually used to joke that every expat who landed in Japan automatically got 2,000 subscribers just from landing in Japan. <laughs> but uh, sadly, those days are long over. And the reality is that over time, as more and more people got onto YouTube, both in audience and creators, it's a lot harder for people to reach that audience than it was back in the day. But just because it's harder doesn't mean it's impossible. There are certainly a lot of success stories of people making vlogs in Japan who have reached subscriber counts far exceeding those of the original J vloggers. I mean, some great examples of that would be Rachel and June, Sharla, Michaela, Chris Broad from Abroad in Japan, John Dobb from Only in Japan, Greg Lamb from Life From Where I'm From, and that's just a small sampling of some of the big creators out here in Japan, who I'm pretty sure you know of. If you're subscribed to me, I'm positive you're subscribed to those guys too. But a lot of people see their numbers and get discouraged because people are thinking, well, if these guys have millions of subs and all the views, like, why are people gonna give a shit about what I have to say? I gotta say that I do value everybody's different perspective on things. And even though, yeah, you may not have the production value like those guys have, or the camera savvy, but you do have your own perspective on things. And I think that everybody's perspective should be shown to get a broader, no pun intended, but a broader picture of living abroad in Japan. You know, for me, I'm a 34 year old US Navy veteran studying abroad in Japan. I originally came out here as a member of the United States Navy when I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan for about two years. And while there's certainly a large military community that comes into Japan, there wasn't really anybody vlogging about their experiences being stationed out in Japan. Certainly none that were active duty. I could tell you that for sure. Even though a lot of veterans also come back to Japan or some never really leave Japan once they get out of the military. They just study abroad like I do on the GI Bill. And I don't really see too many veterans doing that either. So even though, yeah, I don't have the numbers like Chris Broad and all them, but I do have a fairly unique perspective and I'm pretty sure that there's other veterans out there who are looking to study abroad, maybe not necessarily in Japan per se, but just abroad outside of the US and want to learn how to do that on the GI Bill and just how the, how the process works and what life is like on the other side. And that's what I make my videos for. In addition to people who are interested in the, the goings on in Japan and whatnot, but I believe that offering your own perspective will be the best way to make vlogs in Japan that your audience will enjoy. Now, that being said, I wouldn't put too much stock in the amount of viewers, comments, all that sorts of stuff. A lot of people tend to get too metric happy with those sorts of things. And again, this is the harsh realities of vlogging in Japan. But really, those numbers don't matter. It's the people behind those numbers that matter. Because with numbers, you can just keep going up and up and up and up. And it's just a race to the top. And you may not even get that high. But if you really 
put some effort into your community and really connect with the people who do give a fuck about your content, I think you're gonna have a much more enjoyable time here on YouTube. And so speaking of community, one of the things that I absolutely love about vlogging out here in Japan is the IRL community. Uh, before I was stationed out in Yokosuka, I was basically known as the YouTube guy among my friends. Like nobody among my IRL friend group did YouTube aside from maybe one or two videos that I would have to like push them to put out. And uh, beyond that, they just didn't really care. But once I got out to Japan, I was able to meet with a lot of the creators that I watched regularly on YouTube, got to talk shop and just talk about YouTube stuff, you know? And it was really fun to be able to talk to somebody about that in real life. And it allowed me to connect with so many other YouTubers in the area. And it was because of these connections that I established going out to a lot of these YouTube gatherings. Uh, in Japan specifically, there is the YouTube Hanami gathering as well as a summer gathering. And it was due to showing up to these events and networking with people that allowed me to get into freelance video editing. I've been doing it for about four years now. And when I got back to the States after I got out of the Navy, I started working for other channels on Japan, like uh, Eric Surf 6, Brian from Ramen Adventures, just to name a few. I wouldn't have gotten a chance to work with these guys were it not for my time out in Yokosuka or my time going to these networking events when I was stationed out in Japan. And I really love doing freelance video editing. It's allowed me to use my creativity for a different purpose. And I just love seeing someone else's creative vision through and just seeing how they react to the video as well as their audience. And it's just, it brings me like all kinds of joy. You know, I love making videos for myself, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's a different kind of joy making videos for other people. And I've been doing it for four going on five years now. And I absolutely love it. And financially, freelancing has been such a game changer for me. It's allowed me to not have to financially rely as much on a J-O-B job. So I don't have to work quite as much outside of doing that. And, you know, since I've been out here in Japan, the majority of my income has been from the GI Bill as well as freelancing. So, not for nothing, but it's allowed me to really focus on making videos as a career. And so again, just to emphasize, it's not the numbers in the community that really matter. It's the people behind those numbers that matter. And I think if you focus on building a relationship with the people behind those numbers, then eventually you'll see those numbers grow. And even if you don't, you'll still have a much better time on YouTube if you focus on the people and not the numbers. So yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say in this episode of Andy Talks Japandy. And what is that, guys? This is the Andy Son. Sign up for now. And as always, and forever, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. <laughs>